Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we had to find an engineer who wasn't busy eating turkey today, uh, as Chris Tobin was, and we did! Canadian engineers, of course, because they already had their Thanksgiving. Mike Modney is our guest on This Week in Radio Tech, coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, savings, and support, online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics, with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel. Online at nautel.com slash webinars. And by Max Connect Wireless. Prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech Thanksgiving Day Edition. How's your Thanksgiving going? I hope it's going just great. We had a much smaller Thanksgiving uh, gathering than usual, just uh, me and Laura and Michael. I did cook a turkey. In fact, I cooked about everything because uh, Laura's a little un- under the weather. Um, so uh, anyway, it's a shame that we can't uh, spend all that uh, this time with family and friends, but you know, I get it. Hey, it's our 520th episode of This Week in Radio Tech. It is the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And we found we found a great guest today because it's Thanksgiving Day. A lot of engineers are just trying to take the day off. And uh, well, for example, Chris Tobin isn't here today. He may be able to pop in for a few minutes, but he's at a Thanksgiving dinner himself right now. And with uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and uh, New York Transit not running so well on Thanksgiving Day, um, he's uh, he said, he, I probably won't be there. So anyway, welcome in. It's going to be you and me and our guest, and we're going to have a good time on this uh, Thanksgiving afternoon. Let's go ahead and bring our guest in, and then we'll tell you about what's happening at, at Nautel. Our guest is Mike Modney. Hey, Mike, welcome into huh. the show. Hi. Th- happy Thanksgiving to you and everybody on Twerk. <laughs> well, now, you... You're not eating turkey today, and why is that? I'm Canadian. There's Canadian Thanksgiving was about a month ago. I, it's hot. Can you imagine a more pleasant show than a show with a Canadian engineer? They're so polite. <laughs> and and I got my Timmy's ready to go. Ah, I think that's why Martin. I was a little late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see. Oh, I need to uh, remind everybody that I'm coming to you from the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the folks at the Telos Alliance gave me Thanksgiving Day off. Isn't that great? <laughs> and provided some equipment around here to uh, get a few things done audio-wise. I really appreciate the Telos Alliance. My boss is there and uh, the folks who run the place uh, for the opportunity to uh, come to you each week, each Thursday, and do this week in Radio Tech. Hey, real quick, I'll, uh, while Mike's standing by, I'm going to talk about a Canadian company called Nautel. You know, uh, this is the last time this year I'll be telling you about Nautel, but they have they have uh, their transmission talk Tuesday webinars going on for the first three Thursdays, uh, Tuesday, sorry, first three Tuesdays in December. So here's what's coming up. You need to go to the website and check it out. Uh, Let's see. In fact, want to see if I can share my screen and put that um, put that up there from Nautel. There we go. Do I have that one? There we go. All right, you guys. You guys watch that for a second. Is it on the screen? Yeah, there it is. Okay. And Mike's on the screen too. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at that tab. Um, Transmission Talk Tuesday continues in December. December 1st, it's David Layer and Tom McGinley. Oh my gosh, Tom McGinley's on. And David Layer, this is going to be a great show. The session will dive deep into where radio has been and where they and you see it going because it's an interactive show. It's how hybrid internet can factor in what changes we'll see in terrestrial broadcasting, especially as current affairs have us mastering remote broadcast and offices as part of the daily routine. Uh, That's coming up this coming Tuesday, December 1st. Get yourself registered for that. While you're on the site, though, go ahead and register for December 8th. It's Ben Downs and Greg Borgen. They'll talk about AM in general and HD on AM specifically, as well as as, uh, where these owners, these are station owners, see the industry going over the near and long terms. And finally, December 15th, the third Tuesday in December. You can go ahead and register for it now. You'll get a reminder email. That's the way to do it. We'll talk about how Sean balances home and work, but we'll also dive into FM filter construction and how filters work, where there are no physical components, uh, just lengths of pipe and insulators. That, that's 
pretty interesting, with Sean Edwards on December the 15th. So go to nautel.com slash webinars and click on the Transmission Talk Tuesday discussions. By the way, if you, if you got something to say or ask, that's why it's a roundtable. Uh, Jeff Welton will absolutely let you in. You raise your hand. I I actually was on the show for a few minutes this past Tuesday with uh, Garrison Cavell. And uh, and uh, so anyway, and, and, and Cindy, too. Um, check it out. Nautel.com slash webinars. Nautel.com slash webinars webinars check that out and you'll be happy that you did and they're uh they're not having turkey today either at least not in the canadian office <laughs> right mike that's right so um there we go uh, uh th anyway, cool. I, th that, that, that that's the last you'll hear from me about Nautel this year they're going to come back and tell you more uh, next year glad to help Nautel out and get the word out to you i i think with this covid and distancing and stuff that uh the Nautel webinars have just been a godsend it's it's been great to spend time with uh, colleagues and friends and, and to be able to participate with that too. Okay. So our guest is Mike Modney. Mike, tell me uh, where in the world are you in Canada? That's a big place. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, Canada. It's about a six hour drive North of the U uh, S Can uh, Canadian border. Um, and uh, you know, cold and dark up here, but uh, we have, uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of radio stations in the city. We're over a million people here and uh, hustle and bustle. It's a uh, heart of oil country. Now, oh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, you know, I thought most Canadians lived within, I don't know, an hour drive of the U S border. Is, is, is that the case or, or, or not? And in a lot of, in a lot of ways, yes, that is the case. But um, Edmonton is uh, again, a heart of oil country. So, uh, you know, huge trade area up here and, uh, and uh, lots of hustle and bustle. So, uh, um, you know, like over a million people and uh, um, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, it's a, it's a big city up in uh, the northern part here, and uh, we do what we do best up here. Big city. I was looking, and uh, you guys really are – well, I'm in Nashville, which is the typically the 44th um, radio market in terms of size in the U.S. In terms of TV size, it's got – Nashville's got a pretty good uh, – what we call a DMA, so a, an area of dominant influence. So it's a, it's a pretty big area. It's the market number 29 or 30 uh, in the U.S. for TV. But Edmonton is bigger than Nashville in terms of population, isn't it? And I'm glad you told me about that because I, I had to look that up and I went, wow, that that is the case. That's amazing. Um, we're spread out. There's a lot of it's not just Edmonton, but there are a lot of uh, smaller cities that uh, uh, are around Edmonton. And uh, um, it, the trade area is over way over a million people now. So uh, uh, it's very spread out. Um. Okay, so Mike, the first thing that I noticed when I uh, you and I traded some emails ab about the, uh, the the Wabi convention, and I really hadn't seen you until we met online for that. But um, uh, the first thing I noticed when I met you on a vi on a video chat was that you're a lot younger than most engineers. <laughs> what, what's, I am. <laughs> what's going on with that? Tell me how you got uh, how you got started doing this engineering thing, and we're gonna get to. T by the way. We're going to, get to talk about some of the equipment you know nothing about. That's going to be kind of fun. <laughs> Fantastic. So how did you get started? Uh, so I'm I'm 33 years old. Uh, I got my start uh, um, in 2007. Um, uh, I uh, my my father is a broadcast engineer. Uh, he started off uh, when he graduated a program that uh, used to be held in Calgary, Alberta, called uh, the BXST program, which was uh, broadcast technologies. Um, and that program started off in I think it was the late 60s. Um, and uh, and and. Uh, he worked from uh, 70, 78 when he graduated. Uh, he worked in television uh, uh, and, and did that for about 37 years. So uh, I would go to a lot of television uh, transmitter sites, repeater sites, watch how uh, production switchers worked, uh, one inch machines. Uh, uh, he was the king of uh, fixing uh, um, what was the Sony, Sony beta cam machines. Everybody just, mm. uh, everybody just, uh, uh, you know, went to him for that. Uh, that, that was his thing. And, uh, you know, I've built a lot of relationships off of, uh, you know, who he knows. And I've worked with uh, some of some of his friends, some of his colleagues over the years. And uh, and and I, I took the same program in, in 2007, graduated in 2009 and then made my uh, made my start uh, in, in the same way. So um, been doing that uh, now full time since 2009 and have been having a lot of fun with it. You know what? What a lot of times engineers get together and and they reminisce about uh, not the good old days or the bad old days, depending on on what you remember ab about them. But uh, I asked you yesterday, so what do you know about cart machines? And the answer was, you know, not a lot. 
<laughs> not a lot, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I I do know a little bit about tape machines and ta- and and head cleaning and and, oh, uh, yeah. and stuff like that. So uh, it's not all lost on me. Uh, we were a beta <laughs> household. We were a VHS. No, I, I think uh, I think my mom won some sweepstakes on on a on a VHS machine one day, and we we sent it back because all of the Disney films we watched uh, as kids were all on beta. My dad wouldn't have anything of it. Oh so. wow, wow. <laughs> so you, um, your your dad was in, in the radio business as an engineer, and your mom's in the business as well. My mom mom is a, a news director of uh, two radio stations uh, about forty five minutes north of the U.S. Canada border in uh, in my hometown of Lethbridge, Alberta. So uh, <laughs> that's how they met. And uh, the running joke is is if you were going to follow in your footsteps why didn't your dad become a doctor but uh <laughs> <laughs> it's worked out and uh, he had a great career and i'm having fun doing this and um yeah it's been it's been a lot of fun so um oh gosh uh i was gonna oh yeah i want to mention on the stream since today we're using a different platform to produce the show uh those of you watching the show live uh, you're probably watching on facebook because that's the only place we're streaming right now you do have the opportunity to make a comment uh, in the show, if you do it on the Twerk page, on the This Week in Radio Tech page, you can make a comment there, and we can actually put your comment uh, up on the screen. So if you want to ask a, a question of me or Mike Modney, a Canadian engineer, then you're welcome to, and we'll we'll see where, we, you know, this is a, a different format for us, a different platform. Uh, we'll be back to our regular platform uh, next week with Suncast doing the uh, do, doing the switching. I'm just going to try to fill in, you know, I'm filling in until Suncast gets back, or until the computer gets back. So, um, uh, Mike, you, uh, you're, you're, you're uh, LinkedIn profile says you're the chief engineer at Jim Pattison Broadcast Group, Alberta Metro Markets. So Alberta, I, you look at them. I mean, Americans, we look at a map. Oh, that thing's huge. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot of land right there. What are the metro markets in Alberta? So those are Calgary and Edmonton. Um, I've been working in the Edmonton market for about 10 years now. And uh, as our company's grown um, and, and actually we were bought out, we used to be a little kind of a, a, a mom and pop family type company. Uh, uh, we were owned out of a, a little town called Sask or city called Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Oh. Um, you would know Saskatoon tune because our friend uh, Tyler Everett uh, owns a, a Pippin Tech and runs Pippin Tech out of uh, Saskatoon. Who, right. Again, um, you know, when uh, when my mom went back into uh, uh, radio and started doing uh, news directing, um, Tyler Everett was her engineer. So it's a huge full circle. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. So uh, we were purchased by uh, Jim Pattison Broadcast uh, and you know, company that was already had a, a bunch of radio stations and uh, they added uh, Calgary, Edmonton, and uh, and I, I uh, started doing uh, engineering between Edmonton and Calgary. And now because of COVID, I don't really travel as much. So I've been staying a little bit more towards, you know, Edmonton and helping out where we can. But the company is, is amazing because we're not publicly traded. Um, and we have an unbelievable uh, engineering team. Um, everybody has their own strengths. Um, everybody's involved. And if anybody has a question, anybody can reach out any time of day to somebody. And, uh, and, and it's amazing the support that we have here uh, in the Jim Pattison Broadcast Group. We're talking with Mike Modney. He is the chief engineer at Jim Pattison Broadcast Group for the Alberta Metro Markets. That means a huge swath of Canada where they do have radio stations. Uh, coming up on the show, we're going to be talking about some of the, the cool things that Mike has done. Uh, he was a very early adopter of doing MPX over IP. So we're going to talk to him about his experience with that. Um, we're also going to talk about um, his ex- uh, expertise in audio processing, or as they say, processing in Canada. We're also going to uh, talk about their COVID operations there because it's a bit different than what uh, some of the COVID operations I've been finding out about here in the U.S. It's in some ways the same, in some ways different, but all that's coming up in, in just a minute. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you by our friends at uh, Broadcast Bionics and their X-Screen software. We'll be right back. we got more from Mike Modney coming X-Screen 2, the simply amazing new way to control, screen and log calls using your Telos HX6, IQ6 or VX Talk Show systems. Helping you to get the best calls to air quickly and easily. X-Screen 2 is a powerful touchscreen interface that connects alongside your VSET 6 or VSET 12 handsets and even enables you to screen directly on your PC using a USB headset or sound card. X-Screen 2 clearly displays the status of lines and hybrids, quickly captures caller details for screening and automatically stores a log of calls and easily manages station and show directories of important numbers. 
There's also a scheduling clock and chat window for instant messaging and visual talkback to other X-Screen workstations on the system. As soon as the line rings, the caller's name is displayed, if they've rung before, and we can look up their location. X-Screen also usefully shows how many times they've called before and when they last called. You can add alerts to identify nuisance or persistent callers before you've even answered the call. To route a call to the VSET or headset, simply click on the handset symbol, exactly as you would use the button on the VSET. Using the other icon on the line, we can hold the call or route the call to a hybrid. Selecting an alternative device will change the icon key so you'll always know the destination of the call. The tabs on the right-hand side provide more information and control the selected caller. We can add this caller to a caller directory or create a manual entry for someone we call regularly. Calling someone is as simple as just clicking dial on their entry. A free version of X-Screen is included with your HX6, IQ6 and VX Talk Show system. The full version of the software enables the caller database, directories and alerts and other cloud-based features. All Telos customers can try the full version for three months by downloading the free trial. More information is available by contacting Broadcast Bionics or your local dealer. Thanks a lot to Broadcast Bionics for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. It's episode 520. I, this may be the first Thanksgiving Day edition that we've ever done. Usually we we take the day off, but uh, I thought, hey, uh, we got no family over here. I'm not going anywhere. You know, we cooked the turkey and and, and had lunch, uh, and I thought, hey, let's bring somebody in. And who better to bring in than somebody who's not eating turkey? And that's Mike Mike Bondi, Canadian. Wait, uh, I'm sorry, I may have asked you earlier. Wh when did you guys celebrate your Thanksgiving Day in Canada? Was it October the first week of uh, second week of October? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And right before, I'll right before all the snow gets on the field. <laughs> What's traditional food for uh, for your Thanksgiving? It's turkey stuffing, you know, mashed potatoes, you know, the the traditional uh, fold. So yeah. Hey, look, we before we jump into uh, the uh, in interesting things you have to say about your COVID operations, we got a comment here from Laverne Siemens. Laverne says. Mike, congratulations on excellent engineering award you just received from the from Wabi. Tell me about about that. I, I first of all, hello Laverne. I, I Laverne, I have uh, I hold him in such high regard. He is such an amazing man when it comes to transmitters. I learned so much from him, and I, I don't think I got enough from him when I was going to uh, Sate for that broadcast engineering program. Uh, he would text me right in the middle of class on on a Friday afternoon and go, "Hey, I'm out at the AM site." You want to learn how to change FETs. You want to know how to s switch and uh, a tube out. And and he was just that kind of guy. And and you can't find a better mentor than Laverne Siemens. Um, um, and I think he's just re re retired, getting ready to retire now. And, um, you know, and, and still to this day, I'll reach out to him and be like, hey, uh, the outputs of this Marty STL, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, what, which ones have you, have you been using or, or something like that? And, you know, it's I, I love Laverne. Thank you. Congratulations for everything that you've accomplished, Laverne. Uh, you're an amazing man. Thanks, thanks, Laverne, for making the comment. And uh, if you are watching us live, you're welcome to make a comment too uh, on Facebook. Uh, just go to This Week in Radio Tech uh, and make a comment there, and uh, we may be able to pop it up on the screen. In fact, you you bring up an interesting point of what Laverne. Uh, you said your experience was he would call you from the transmitter side and say, "Hey, I'm replacing. I'm doing this today, doing that today. Do you want to come see how it's done?" And I must say, uh, Mike, there's been so many times in my career when I have felt like, you know, I could almost do this with my eyes closed. I need to show somebody else how to do this. Not, I don't know, uh, part of, partly because I didn't want to do it the rest of my life. I thought I need to move on from replacing pinch rollers and capacitors in tape machines uh, or FETs in, in transmitters. I need to show this to somebody else to, so that, that they can make money doing it while I move on to something else. What, what As a young engineer, what's your feeling about showing somebody else the way i i love doing that um you know i took some people out from my class uh because i when i was work oh, so when i went to sate uh i would drive about 45 minutes south of calgary uh for uh, i worked at a uh at an am radio station that uh, uh laverne was the director of engineering for and uh as long as it was okay with the general manager i would take them out to the am site and and kids in my class always got a kick out of you know all the tuning huts and and how am really works and uh and i don't think that people are really exposed to that and and people really understand that so um you know i think that was a huge uh, uh, uh that was that was huge back then and now um uh, it's you know 
if I learn something new, I just want to share it immediately. And I don't think we have enough time because we're putting out fires everywhere we possibly can. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's the, the passing on of knowledge is, is huge. And, uh, and, and my dad was in television. So he taught me as much of television as I possibly could, uh, could know. So when I got into television in 2009, um, it was that transition, at least in Canada, from going um, from analog to, you know, working in HD SDI and, and, and switching out all of the studio cameras and, and, you know, new green screen set software. So it was, I kind of got the best of the old with the best of the new and, and, and having <laughs> to learn that myself. So anything that I've retained from, you know, people who've come before me, um, I'm quick to say, hey, you know, there's a way to do this because I, I work for a very socially char uh, socially interactive charge radio station. And every now and then someone will bring up the idea of like, oh, hey, why aren't you playing records on the air? Um, because that's the big thing. And, um, you know, OK, how do we hook up a record or a, a, a record player mm. into an AOIP facility? So, uh, um, you know, oh, I'm first to jump at that. Let's go ahead and do that. So, you know, um, for the last oh, 10 years that I've been here, I'm the go to person when they say, hey, Mike, we're going to play records on the air. Can you come in here and, and do that quarter turn thing you do? Uh, you know, we don't know what the <laughs> hell you're doing. So. <laughs> well, look, look, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll bite when what turntable did you choose to actually play some vinyl uh, on the air? So we started off with one of those, you know, cheapo USB ones. And then uh, when they found that, uh, hey, it got actually pretty good ratings that we could uh, we could make something of this. Uh, it's uh, we're doing it about twice a year. So it's not kind of overplayed. We do it about an hour a year. Uh, the creative team came up with the idea. They call it Vinally Friday. Ah, um, what a great <laughs> moniker. Vinally Friday. <laughs> and uh, we do it right before uh, each May long weekend and September long weekend. So um, we, we spent some money and bought a nice Technics uh, turntable. And it got to the point where uh, people wanted to hear so much packed into an hour that they said, uh, can we put two turntables on there? So you're yeah. not you know, like flipping the discs out. Right. And it's right. it's absolutely incredible to <laughs> kind of reflect on that when when you're playing albums on the air, um, you know, people used to do that you know years ago and and if you're not exposed to that um you don't realize how much work is involved oh, um, oh you're, you're, yeah 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 you're doing something your record shucks oh, reading labels putting it on queuing it up. oh that's not the song i wanted and putting it away and yeah. sometimes it was all you could do especially if you're playing if you're in the middle of a beatles song oh my god you had two minutes and 18 seconds to get the next song going yeah exactly I, or, 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 or in our case, you know, we grab a, we grab an, an album, throw it on, and it's like, ah, it was a live version. We didn't want to play the live version. How did that get put in there? <laughs> I, I, I got I to tell you what the worst is. Uh, I mean, album stations have it a little bit better. And back in the disco era, I worked at an AM station during the disco era, and it was easy to find, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 minute songs. I and mean, there was a, there was, I don't know, like a 13 minute version of Dolly Parton singing Baby I'm Burning Out of Control. And it was, yeah, it was great. You could go to the bathroom and you would run, run down the street and, you know, get a pack of cigarettes if you didn't see. But, uh, but what the, the worst, the worst music to play on vinyl as a disc jockey is bluegrass because the songs are a minute and 27 seconds. <laughs> you can't so, get anything in that. Just, no. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we've experienced that too. Try, you know, everybody wants to hear Johnny Cash. I, I'm, can't fault them for it, but you know, you throw it on and, you know, especially with today's processing technologies, you just hear every crackle and every pop on the air and we throw it on and it's like, okay, that was Johnny Cash. Okay. We don't even have the next one queued up. So. Ah. <laughs> well, you, you know, actually that's worth asking about. Uh, you, um, you're really good at audio processing and, uh, I, I, I think you've got a, a bunch of Omnia processors there. Appreciate that. Thank you for my employer. Um, what do you, uh, we we tend to crank. I mean, if you want to crank your processing and be aggressive with it, you can, but it does assume that you've got some clean source material, really For squeaky sure. clean source material. If it ain't, I mean, if it's an MP3 or if it's been through any kind of, you know, a bad life uh, or badly mastered from the studio, uh, you, you it's not going to sound as good if you want to crank it hard. What do you do with vinyl that's going to have some aberrations on it? Well, I think I've, what I've learned over the years um, is to kind of create like a low or like a high pass filter and make sure that, you know, anything um, under about 40 or 50 hertz gets, well, I don't even think it's about, you know, 40, 50, but it, it, that's just all, you know, cut out. Um, but uh, 
you know, I, I, again, I, I gotta, I gotta give a head nod to the, uh, the folks at Omnia who, who helped with this, um, perfect Clipper has helped uh, a lot of those albums out. And, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, if, if you were to turn it on or turn it off and play a, an, an album through it, um, you would notice that even perfect Clipper has a way of cleaning up, um, really crackly and pop um uh, uh, uh albums um I, I don't think that should have any effect on it but it really does so again there's my head nod to uh the great folks at omnia for uh for for getting that put in uh in their processors so uh for processing you're you, you're using omnia 11s is that right yep absolutely okay, okay. Yes. And, and and you can get a, a, a the declipper the perfect declipper in, in, in there yeah and 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 learning how to properly clean albums that's uh yeah that's uh something that everybody just kind of has to discover on their own too. So uh, um, because we're such a socially interactive radio station, um, people have kind of fed on that a little bit over the years. And, and we had a gentleman a few years ago uh, text us and say, Hey, um, my dad had all th this huge collection and we don't know what to do with it. We don't have a record player, but you know, we listen to your show. We know that you do th uh, this program uh, twice a year. Can you take uh, some albums off our hands? We said, sure. Okay. Thinking like we're going to get, you know, artists that nobody has ever heard of yeah. well no he brought down some just incredibly uh well taken care of albums and and we're not talking about like just one record crate we're talking you know probably up to a thousand albums to to the point now where we can do that show and just flip through a book or go through excel and be like okay is it in our library and can we go and grab it so um we have our own record collection here and i think that's really cool well, you kind of hit on something about being socially interactive, and and you're not talking about social media interactive. You're talking about people in the buildings uh, socializing and feeding off each other on on the air. And let's 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 go there uh, because playing records obviously requires ma hand manipulation. A person has to do that. Uh, so uh, your uh, your radio station, what one hundred two point three now radio? Yep. Uh, that one, that station in particular has a lot of interaction among the people who are on the air. Your audience expects that. And then along comes COVID. Tell me what you guys did. How did you react? And how have you found ways to work so that the audience knows that your, your announcers are still uh, interacting with each other well? Yeah, it's been incredibly difficult, difficult, especially for a station like now radio. Um, we're live 18 hours a day. You know, we lose you. We used to be live 24 hours a day in, in, in some instances. And uh, when COVID hit, um, we were looking at radio stations across the group and, and where we could, you know, shift resources. You know, if someone got sick, what we could do, um, you know, to isolate uh, the 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 illness um to make sure that you know nobody's getting sick this isn't spreading it's not affecting the on-air product and in a lot of stations in a lot of cases you can send somebody home with some uh, uh you know a codec and some remote equipment and it's not that big of a deal but because uh now especially is so interactive with the people inside the building with the people uh we call them now family members and they really are a, a family um you know we do you know, carnivals and, and, uh, haunted houses that we build, um, bottle drives, it, you know, those are just three small things that, that we do and are, are really well known for, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the city. And, uh, you know, how do you tell the audience that, Hey, look, you can't come down. Whereas we would just, you know, openly invite them, come on in, meet, you know, meet us, you know, we are real people, you know, uh, this is a, this is a family type environment. And, um, uh, I, I think what we've done is we've chosen to keep the on-air staff uh, as safe and 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 healthy as possible by, you know, this is their domain. We're going to send everybody else home. So instead of sending the on-air staff home, this is their domain. We're making sure that they're safe. Everything's good. They're, they're set up, good to go. But everybody else goes home. So walking through here, it kind of feels like a uh, like a, a stat holiday. Uh, it almost kind of feels like a, a Thanksgiving <laughs> or a Christmas because I walk through the halls of this big studio and these and these and these uh, this big station, and there's nobody here. Um, so you know, it's and and it's kind of that gym mentality: wipe the equipment down before 
you leave, wipe ah. it down before, you know, after you leave or sorry, after you leave, before you get there. And uh, then they've been doing a really good job of doing that. So um, while the case numbers have started to go up in Edmonton, in Calgary, in Winnipeg, um, and as we've been starting to go into lockdown, well, semi lockdown in some of these cities, um, they're, they're safe doing um, what they do best. And, and that gives them the, uh, the ability to still out, uh, you know, still make great content and, 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 and have that audience there and have that interaction um, and keep that family type environment. So uh, they're able to work safely, but be a, be a little bit separate, but still have that on air interaction. So th- do you, is anybody working any on air people working from home or are they all coming in, but being safe while in? So we have two people on our classic hit station uh, uh, working from home. Um, mm-hmm. We have a new uh, newer automation system where we can send them home with an iPad and a voice track from there. And the best thing about this uh, latest version is um, they can voice track within, you know, five minutes of, of that being uh, on the air. So uh, we have a gentleman in the evening who's doing that uh, right from home. And I went on, uh, I went on a quick two day vacation back in September and, and on, for a person who's never worked with an iPad before I thought I was going to be getting back from vacation um, and and walking him through how to uh, how to do this mm-hmm. and I, I got back to Edmonton I was listening I was listening to a show and I said hey did you track it in the studio and he says oh no I figured it out uh, it's no problem <laughs> said, but you've never used an iPad before he's no no I figured it out no problem it's all good and it's on the air and and uh, he even built his own little studio in his basement uh, he doesn't want to leave uh, the house so uh he's safe and sound down there and he's happy and, and the station and and the, the content sounds amazing. Can I ask which, which automation uh, brand you decided to go with to do that? That is wide orbit. Uh, we decided okay. as a company uh, to, uh, to go up to the latest 4.0 version and accelerate ah. that. And mm-hmm. it's a good thing we did because right at the time we were accelerating that uh, COVID had hit. So it was, you know, get these systems upgraded and on the air as soon as possible to the point now where all the stations in Patterson are running 4.0. Uh, you know, we can have a track on the air from one of these iPads in four to five minutes. It's in, it's really amazing. Uh, you're, you're the second person that mentioned that uh, wide orbit 4.0, uh, Gary Morrill, uh, who engineers stations in Michigan, um, um, had, they said some of their stations that are, had gone to that version as well. And that they were, uh, almost everybody was working from home, but you've, again, you've still got people coming in, uh, but being safe because, uh, it just felt like you needed that, that interaction. Um, absolutely. Uh, and I'm, oh, and oh, I just yeah, wanted to touch base on yeah. one thing um, because we're so uh, we're, we're we do such unique things uh, with the with the family that we've built and the audience uh, that we have um, uh, twice this uh, throughout COVID since uh, you know we've kind of gone into this uh, semi lockdown sort sort of state. Uh, we've done uh, uh, a radio play, a Halloween radio play. Normally. <laughs> What we do is we we have a a garage right across from the radio station, kind of like a looks like a little bit of a warehouse, and the landlords let us uh, use it for about two weeks. Um, we have some uh, uh, listeners come down, and 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 the uh, on air staff we all decorate this huge warehouse to make a uh, to make a free to the public uh, uh, haunted house that we run for two or three days, and we mic it. We uh, you know, throw some different, uh, you know, costumes on and we all have fun scaring people. And Edmonton loves that. The area loves that. And they all come down and we have, you know, probably a thousand people who come down um, um, throughout Halloween to take part in this, uh, to take part in this uh, uh, haunted house. And because we can't do that, <laughs> um, the creative team decided to write a Halloween haunted house or a Halloween themed play. <laughs> and just like you do back in the day, they acted it out live on the air. Now there are restrictions with that because in a workplace, you know, everybody has to wear a mask. You have to be six feet apart from everyone. Right. And there's 10 on air announcers so, so you got all gathered that? around a, a microphone like we saw them do old time radio shows exactly you know yeah. and you can't share you can't do anything like that so um the, the the beautiful thing about aoip and we're an aoip facility is that you know you can plug that uh extra note in add as many more uh microphones and processing that you need and within you know a couple of hours i had everybody mic'd up everybody had their own headphones ready to go and they did it live on the air um uh this this radio play and 
everybody loved that. So I think they want us to do it again. Um, <laughs> it's it's not an easy undertaking. I know it took quite a long time for our creative staff to write this play, and uh, they might be up to the challenge again. We'll have to see, but uh, time will tell. Now, were, were the different actors all on site in the same building, or were some of them off site? No, they were all within the same building, but all okay. different rooms. So gotcha. we had main gotcha. on air, like a news booth, outside yeah. in a hallway. Uh, yeah, so you know, and and, and it's kind of neat because they'd come up to me and they say, "Hey, this in the script, uh, this person uh, sounds like they're walking down a corridor." Ah, oh, perfect. We'll just put them in the foyer because uh, <laughs> it sounds like a a long hallway out there. So it kind of was to our advantage, and uh, yeah, it was it was a fun time, and and the family and the, the listeners loved it, and it was it was great. We're talking to Mike Modney. Uh, he is the chief engineer for the Jim Pattison stations in Alberta, in the uh, metro areas. So that's Calgary and Edmonton, Alberta. Coming up uh, on the on the Halloween theme, we're going to talk about briefly about something called karaoke. That's coming up. I, I, I love it. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store, BGS. The website is bgs.cc. And if you want to take great phone calls and make Good bits to go on the air. Uh, I mean, really professionally. Do it like do it do it like the big boys do uh, in the big cities. You can use something called Vox Pro. We'll be right back after this. Yo, what's up? Live from NAB 2018. Hey, it's Caden. Uh, you need to check out Wheatstone and Vox Pro 7.1. The upgrades are amazing. If you're a jock, if you're a talent producer, whatever a, a morning show. Everyone knows Vox Pro, everyone uses Vox Pro, everyone loves Vox Pro, but now the features for this year, 2018, on 7.1 are amazing. If you're using, uh, using version 4.5.6 and you go to 7, this is exactly what you're missing right here. The features are a game changer. It's gonna cut down your editing time by like 80%, depending on what you use Vox Pro for. And with uh, version 7.1, introducing unlimited practic button bars right here, hotkeys right here. I'm gonna show you coming out of a song. Bad things, it's a lot of bad things that they wish and wish and wish and wish. So you're coming out of your song? Yeah. Start your next song right here. It's basically an entire production room right on Vox Pro. So it's the Vox Pro we know and love with a ton more features. And now uh, this is the ultimate game changer right here, effect macros. So instead of hitting your effects button bar and going up here using your mouse for every effect, you do it right here with one click of the mouse and you're gonna cut down your editing time by about 80% without even touching this new sexy black controller. Check it out right here, Wheatstone Vox Pro 7.1 at NAB in Vegas 2018. From the folks at Broadcasters General Store at bgs.cc. And uh, you can call them at uh, 352-622-7700. Got that memorized, dialing that number from 25, 30 years ago. 352-622-7700 for Broadcasters General Store. Everything you need for broadcasting, they got it there. They've got a lot of TV gear there, too. So, And if you're doing, you know, visual radio, TV and on your radio station, Talk to BGS. They got they got the best ideas. All right. It's uh, episode 520 of This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack here. Unfortunately, Chris Tobin is not joining us right now. Uh, he may be able to call in. I don't think so, but he's enjoying some turkey. And we had to search far and wide. Well, actually, we just had to go to Canada and to find an engineer who wasn't doing Thanksgiving Day today because he already did it ahead of us because, you know, their growing season is much shorter there. The crops all come due uh, Mike, do you have a lot of farming there in, in uh, Alberta? Do, yes. And especially where I grew up in the South. Well, where I grew up in the South. Well, I'm only 33. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. I got a, <laughs> not that old yet. Um, yeah, in this, in, in Southern Alberta, huge farming community. Absolutely. Ah. So, uh, and, and, and like the radio stations, my mom works for down there. Um, you know, the city is only a hundred thousand, but the trade area is, you know, 300,000. So, um, you know, you need that hundred thousand Watts, uh, to cover a uh, huge swaths of area down there. So I mentioned just for the break, karaoke. Uh, you described that how this worked, and I thought, yeah, but there's delays and stuff. And you said, no, it actually worked the way we did it. Tell me about karaoke. Right. So one of the uh, promos that the radio station uh, kind of came up with ten years ago was uh, bringing people down. We would rent out a a, a section in a bar uh, that was really well known uh, in Edmonton and have people come down and sing like it's karaoke and there were prizes at, at the end and 
a lot of people had fun with it. Uh, it, it. It's one of those things where it's just it's just renowned with what we do. And uh, it was sh- shortly after COVID had happened and some of the lockdowns had happened. And, and uh, it's like, OK, well, what are we going to do here? People can't leave their houses. You know, it's only essential services. All the bars are closed. Um, what are we going to do? And we just kind of came up with this idea that, well, everybody's talking on Zoom. Everybody's talking on Teams. Um, what happens if we were to get maybe, you know, eight or 10 people on here uh, on a Teams call and then get the announcers in different rooms and put it live to air? And I, I think a lot of programmers came back and said, people singing karaoke. Yeah, I, I don't think that's uh, I think that's a ratings killer. Um, so <laughs> so what what we ended up doing was we sent a private link out to uh, a bunch of the a bunch of our, our family members, our listeners, and um, they joined us for a, a private Zoom call. And then we got the announcers to go into separate rooms, mic up, um, put headphones on, and uh, they were all part of this huge uh, Zoom call that went live to air. And I think part of the part of the way that we were able to accomplish this was just using an IP driver, uh, kind of like a codec. Uh, so the, the the host was sitting right in front of the board, like you would always do, you know, talking on like talking on a. Uh, like a hybrid call, um, except it was over Zoom. And he had the ability to um, mute and unmute uh, people as they went. And uh, we would uh, we would press uh, the song that was supposed to play back to them over a hotkey. And uh, you'd think that there'd be a huge delay there. But if you're going uh, one person at a time, it actually worked out really well. And it sounded great on the air. And people had fun with it. You know, I, and I think that it may also be a, a, a bit of a case of these, these video chat platforms um, are becoming, uh, they're figuring out how to do it with lower and lower delay. They're figuring mm-hmm. out where the right places are to do some of the coding, to pass things around. They're getting more and more servers spread out. So you're dealing less with the speed of light, you know, from here to, you know, their ser- their only server they have in, in Seattle, you know, or Miami or something. So I think these are getting better. I'm not sure that, I don't know that you can have a band and actually do something I know some choir, uh, some choirs and barbershop quartets tried this early in COVID and it wasn't working out for them. Um, but, but Microsoft, I've heard other good things about Microsoft Teams and low latency and really good audio quality on Microsoft Teams. So, Right. And yeah. we had a rehearsal with all of them ahead of time uh, just to say, you know, if you can plug in, that'd be great. If you can tell your kids, hey, mommy's going to be on a, a, a Zoom call. She's going to be singing. This will be a little weird to tell your kids. Um, <laughs> if you could just, you know, not use all the bandwidth with Netflix uh, and and everybody uh, uh, everybody complied and uh, they just shut all their streaming services off. They plugged in, they put headphones on, had a nice, you know, and, and, and you don't even need an expensive mic or a huge interface to do it. Uh, um, everybody sounded really, really great. You, you know, for for doing things on mic, I, and I realize you've got a great mic. What, what is that one? Is that a Sennheiser or something? So this is an AKG. Oh, AKG. Uh, C- yeah, C4500. I don't think you can get these anymore because we wanted to put these in a, a different studio and I had to go with a different AKG product. Uh-huh. Um, it's what our uh, program directors uh, kind of tend to uh, swing towards. Um We've got a lot of announcers who like to go off mic, off access, uh, off access and uh, uh the RPDs are are huge fans of these, so uh, ah, okay. yeah, yeah. So that one has maybe more of, of a of a uh, not a hypercardioid shape, but it's a it, it's it's wide enough to get you off axis a bit. It's okay. Absolutely, yes, yeah. I've, so. I, and and I know what you mean. I, when I was you know doing full time engineering, I would try to pick mics because yeah, jocks would be hunting around like this. I always tried to make sure they were mic processed and the right place for their fader to be was all the way up. If they were on okay. that way, that way they wouldn't blast the meters out, right? Hey, smart. A, a, everything else on your console, you know, goes at the zero mark, but your mic, put them all the way up, you'll be fine. And and uh, and 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 I, you know, had a fair amount of compression. So if they got off mic, it would, you know, the compressor would dig down and mm, suck that up. Although the, I would always put the expansion threshold and the compression threshold right next to each other. So okay. if they weren't, if they shut up, if there was some room noise, it would get knocked right back down. So right. yeah, it, it was either expanding or it was compressing. It was never in the middle. Now, not, not everybody likes that sound, but it worked for me. Right. And I think that's kind of the, the difficulty I'm having right now with our studios because we're on an on-ramp uh, onto one of the bigger uh, highways wow. here, our freeways here in Edmonton. And I think people have figured out because they're listening to the radio station, if they gas it right by, by the window and the announcer's talking, oh. yeah, they're they're 
their engine gets on the air. So we'll have to figure something out. Well, you know, down here in the south where I live, uh, they figured <laughs> that out. They put the they put that Dixie uh, horn that did 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 well, and uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's just changing the environment, the landscape is just changing in the way people are getting their, their, uh, their radio and their content. Um, you know, when I, I started at these two radio stations, uh, 10 years ago, and it was very traditional, like, you know, it, it, and we're, we're, we're PPM rated in this market. So even if you're off the air for one second, you know, like that's, you know, big problem. Uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. I've got three different transmitter sites for, for offsite backup. Um, you know, these stations have to stay on the air. And so, you know, let's say if there was a, a, a lightning strike or, or a power outage in the gen set kicked on, um, you know, the owners, you know, the owners didn't like it, but there's not too much that you can do about it. It's just kind of reducing the downtime as much as possible. And and, and we've done a really good job about uh, doing that. Um, but, you know, 10 years ago when I started, if like, let's say the gen set kicked in and, uh, you know, you went down to like a smaller pattern, you know, you'd get texts into the radio station and say, hey, what happened? Um and uh and and if you if your streaming went down it wouldn't be that big of a deal but now it's to the point where uh especially with the 1023 now radio station uh if the transmitter does even go offline for a couple seconds and the the backup kicks in no one will really text in anymore but mm. if streaming goes down oh there's hell to pay um and we as a company are now you know we're we're we've always treated it like you know it's it's the fm transmitter um a lot of our stations now have those in, in Ovonix, uh streaming monitors yeah and we hooked we have them hooked up to dialers um um uh, myself and a bunch of my colleagues if streaming goes down even for a couple of seconds a dialer is calling us to say it's like hey you know the transmitter's off the air so that is incredibly important and you know, uh, you got to find solutions to, uh, to keep your uptime as, uh, as high as possible. Now, do you have any, any notion as to, uh, uh, what your average or what your peak number of listeners are on, on a given station stream? Uh, you know, I knew at one time, I, I'm, I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to touch on that just cause, yeah. uh, anything I say is, uh, <laughs> it oh, probably and, and, could be under or over. So, uh, well, uh, and, I, and it, it, might, it might be insider knowledge, you know, you, uh, even, even if you did know, I, I so. think, I think so too. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that from my, my own little radio stations in Mississippi and Hawaii and Samoa, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go anywhere from, you know, three listeners to, uh, to uh, 50 or 60 listeners. So it's obviously it's becoming more and more important. And so, yeah, we're paying more attention, uh, to making sure that the streams always sound good. We've got the, you know, the, 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 the zip stream software. So there's, there's always Omnia processing on there. You got me saying processing now and, <laughs> And, and our, our internet's, you know, getting more and more reliable uh, over time. So, uh, and do you have any listeners that are like in way far away places like really, but this guy really likes our, our stream. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> our previous owners were really big into video because they wanted to prove that, you know, uh, you know, we're not just some, we're not just at a traditional radio station. Watch watch our announcers work. You know, we're a family, you know, we've got nothing to hide. So we have a 24 seven live video stream, um, mm. with a provider. And, and it's the same case, you know, if, if that goes down, um, again, there's, uh, there's, uh, the, you know, uh, we got to make sure that those, those, uh, that has uptime as, 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 as high as possible. And in a lot of cases where our streaming has gone down, I've actually told, um, if, uh, myself and the announcers have actually texted back to listeners to say, Hey, have you tried our video stream? And, 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 yeah. and, and over the years, um, you know, people really didn't gravitate towards that video stream because, uh, they're watching or they're listening on their cell phone. They don't want to eat up a lot of bandwidth, but now some of the cell providers in Canada are offering 20, 50 gig data packages. So it's not really that big of a deal if you watch it in small doses now. So, um, you, you know, we have, we have, uh, we have a video stream that's 24 seven. And even if you're looking at the back of their, of your head of, of the announcer's head, we have people in Australia going, Hey, you know, 
switch the camera angle up kind of thing. <laughs> um, talk to me about uh, about micro MPX. This is a technology that uh, I think Hans von Zutphen came up with uh, some years ago, and it was available on a sort of experimental basis. Um, uh, maybe he wouldn't call it experimental, but I didn't want to have my com my a computer at my transmitter site decoding micro MPX and going through some sound card that kind of did 192 kilohertz sampling. Uh, I was wanting a real appliance to come along that was more robust. Anyway, people I work for at Omnia came up with the MPX node that that is the appliance I wanted. Uh, I believe you've experimented with this or have got one on the air. Tell me about, about uh, the benefits or what your thoughts are about MPX over IP. Right. So I had mentioned that we've got a lot of offsite transmitters at these radio stations. So I choose to have my processors back at the station um, and, and have a, a, a composite analog feed, a traditional composite analog feed out to my uh, to, to my transmitter sites. And um, there was a, 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 about a couple of years ago, the power company had come to us and said, hey, you know, we got to replace these power lines that are going down X street. So we're going to put power lines down this street and it may, you know, interfere with that uh, STL link that you have. So we went back and forth with the power company and, and we had decided that, you know, they're going to do their thing. They don't think it's going to interfere with us. Um, their engineer said, well, we don't think it's going to interfere with your signal, but just to be on the safe side, um, I was looking at what kind of technologies were available, um, but not having uh, a huge budget to have a, 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 like an, a, an IP link going out to the site. Um, I had to see what other options were available. And it was at the exact same time that micro MPX uh, was coming out uh, in, in the, chassis and uh, the physical chassis so i had bought a couple boxes and uh i still own them to this day um it's it, it's on for both radio stations i've got two micro mpx boxes at the studio two micro mpx boxes out at the transmitter site and um i have a fiber link i worked with the internet our, our telco provider uh to have a direct internet fiber feed from our studios out to the transmitter site so i'm I, I don't even have to worry about bandwidth. Uh, I don't have to worry about that 320 kilobits mm. per second. Yeah. Um, even though it works just great at 320, um, I run them at the full 576. Sure. And uh, and and you know I'm able to pass RDS and the entire MPX uh, spectrum uh, along along the way. And um, they've since fired up that uh, that power line and, and built it. But you know there were a couple of days where they would say, "Hey, look at we'll have a crane in the way." And I was a little bit unsure if you know, look at you know you got. You got really highly rated radio stations here. I don't. I can't risk going down. Um, so I would just pop the station onto MPX node, and and the best thing about it was nobody knew. Um, you know, RDS was still passing. Uh, the audio still sounded like it was. You know, big city Omni Eleven audio processing, and and that was the huge advantage of of implementing micro MPX. Now, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no! I was gonna uh, for you. It, it, it was this alternative to your your over the air. Uh, you sent me some spectrographs of the cleanliness of the doing this by micro MPX, and and uh, I years ago I had experienced that that really drove home the fact for me that whatever audio aberrations, whatever noise and distortion, even low level noise, whatever noise shows up in your STL. In this case, it was an analog composite STL that many people still use. Um, you will transmit that 24 seven on your FM station. So if you've got some, if you've got a noisy STL link, you've got a noisy FM station, there's nothing you can do about it. Talk to me a, a bit about the cleanliness and if you know, how that's affected the way people, or at least maybe you perceive your FM station. Yeah. I'm glad that you touched on that because, um, you know, i didn't start off doing a lot of audio processing, but uh, as the years have gone on, um, it's just something that I uh, really wanted to get into and perfect. And and my dad was a huge, you know, audiophile, and uh, uh, I I just I like clean audio, and I like making the PDs happy in that way. So I kind of got frustrated when we would go up to different versions, and I'm like, well, I can't get the station sound the way I want to, while still respecting you know that that hundred uh, percent modulation. So um, one of the, one of the huge advantages is just like you said, is just getting that noise floor a lot, a lot lower. Uh, and over the years, like, uh, I just, let's, let's just see here. That's a, uh, 22 kilometer, 
uh, hop. So in miles, that's 13.6 miles. That's a 13.6 mile hop. And, and normally you wouldn't think that, you know, analog, uh, an analog composite STL would, um, you know, degrade over 13, 13 and a half miles, but, uh, you know, you really hear the noise in that signal. And, and the first night that I went over to micro MPX, um, it was a, a crossover between a couple of different songs. And I went, Oh, wow. Wow. I have never heard this radio station be mm -hmm. that clean before. Um, so if, if, if someone's thinking about that product to solve a different problem, um, like a, you know, like a, having a different STL feed or a different STL link, um, think about the benefits that you're going to get just from cleaning up the audio. Um, and you're, you're able to, um, process a little bit better, um, knowing that that noise floor is, was it like, you know, 90 dB down, 100 dB down? It's incredible. You you are so right. And as engineers, we, we should know this, but we've, you know, we've used composite uh, analog STLs for years. Now, I know we have digital uh, composite STLs now, too, and we have digital STLs that deliver left-right discrete audio to the transmitter site, and you put your processor out there. Totally get that. Uh, but for those of us who've been accustomed, hey, I've got, you know, probably eight radio stations that uh, have some kind of composite analog STL and they, they work fine for what they are, but you don't realize that noise that's 65 DB down is still noise mm -hmm. and, and you do perceive it. And, and so when you, when you can use micro MPX uh, or, and I, I bring that up because I'm familiar with the technology. I know there are other uh, MPX over IP equipment out there. Uh, most of them take anywhere from three to 12 megabits per second to get the IP out there. It is linear. Micro MPX is not linear, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's an algorithm that is not psychoacoustic. It's mathematical only. And the, the artifacts fall into places that we're going to filter out anyway. So um, it, it's, it's really a very clever scheme, but the point there is being, the noise is literally 95 to 100 dB down, as shown on the spectrographs that you supplied to me. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, this is so clear. Even next to the pilot, you know, you're, yeah. you're 95 dB down on either side of the stereo pilot. And above the RDS uh, signal, there's no, you're 100 dB down. It's yeah, just, and you and well, and I want to get across too. Some some po for, uh, some people have mentioned because uh, you did a talk for us, and thank you very much for doing that talk uh, for Wabi about the MPX node. Um, you know, I had some comments after the show that said, "Hey, you know, I'm in a PPM market, like like we are. Um, you know, is this going to affect PPM?" And I, I said, "No, it it doesn't at all." Yeah. So uh, um, I I think that uh, is playing into a factor for a lot of people, kind of grasping that a little bit and it's it and i've said no um it doesn't affect ppm at all so um that that's huge yeah yeah P ppm is audio it's carried right through and and again exactly I'm, I'm not at liberty to reveal everything i know about it but i will say again that that micro mpx algorithm and, and you can get it I, it's convenient to buy it from from omnia but you can also get it in the stereo tool software you can get it in um in Leif clayson's uh software and and hardware stuff uh you know there's other ways to get it i like it because it's an appliance from my friends at, at, at omnia but um uh, it's not psychoacoustic. It's not MP3 or AAC or MP2. Uh, it is a mathematical algorithm that's not that doesn't depend on the way your ears hear. And yes, there are artifacts, but the artifacts fall in places that we're going to filter 200 dB down anyway. Right. So it, it's it's like it that doesn't matter. So that that that's that's cool. I'm I'm glad that you uh, had done that experimentation with it. We've got um, tell you what we're gonna. Um, take a take our last break here and when we come back uh i want to hear a little bit about your experience with audio over ip we'll have a tip of the week and we'll be done on this thanksgiving day so our show this week in radio tech is brought to you in part by our friends at max connect wireless you know i'm a big fan of josh bone and his max connect wireless uh, uh system because it works it works well it works in places where you wouldn't expect it to work and in situations where you wouldn't expect a perfect uh you know ip data signal to work so here's a friend to tell you about. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. MaxConnect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the MaxConnect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web and made us much more secure moving forward. It has also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. 
Thanks, John. And uh, this is the this is the box. Although it comes in several different boxes, Pep Wave, and this one's a Cradle Point. This is the Max Connect Wireless 4G LTE modem. And not that the modem is anything special. It's not. It's an off the shelf modem. What's special is the SIM cards because it connects to its own APNs, the APNs belonging to Max Connect Wireless. And you get priority data prioritized over everybody else. You also get static IP addresses. So check it out from Max Connect wireless.com. Hey, our other sponsor is um, Angry Audio. And if you're operating from home, if you got a home studio, if you're doing podcast studios, you know, it's kind of tough to uh, pay for an extra phone line to put people on the air. Well, you can use the magic of your cell phone and Bluetooth and this box right here from Angry Audio, the Bluetooth audio gadget. And this thing is designed really right. By the way, this little box is heavy. It's got a real power supply in the inside and real components. It, it, it hasn't been skimped on at all. It's a little bit heavy. Uh, it does have rubber feet on the bottom, so it sits real nicely um, on your on your table. It's got professional uh, inputs and outputs on the back. You've got um, an analog input. You've got analog outputs left and right if you do, do want to stream stereo out of your phone. And it has a digital AES output as well, if you're going to go into a, a, an AES EBU input on your audio console. It's easy to pair this thing. So a disc jockey can walk in the studio or go into their own home studio, click this spring-loaded pairing button, and pair it with their phone. And just use their phone as the phone hybrid. Put callers on the air that way. The Bluetooth audio gadget from angryaudio.com. You need to check out their website, angryaudio.com. And you know why else? Because Angry Audio has all the Studio Hub gear, these uh, favorite little gadgets here. I used some of these yesterday to hook up, uh, well, something I'm going to show you in the tips, uh, to hook up some radios to my Axia network here. It was really good. And if you, if, you, if you don't like this version, they also have the version where you've got a long cable in different lengths and the uh, RJ45 that goes into your... Uh, your Axia X node or your, your Wheatnet blade, uh, whatever, you know, they use typically are using RJ45 connectors uh, with the Studio Hub standard. And on the other end, you can get whatever connectors you like. This happens to be the, uh, I think this is the six foot model right here. I need to untangle that someday. Um, so check it out. Studio Hub gear, all available at angryaudio.com. Don't fall for an imitation. Get the real stuff because you can, you can, well, ask for your 20% discount and get that too. All right. This week in Radio Tech, our 520th episode. Happy Thanksgiving to you. And uh, we have uh, uh, still with us here is Mike Modney from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, Mike, uh, let's touch for a second on audio over IP. Your studios are built on this technology. Yes, it is. And uh, built uh, turnkey by Pippin Technology. I got to give my little nod to them um, from Saskatoon. Um, I came in to the studios when they were only six months old and... Uh, it was all Axia, uh, uh, Livewire, um, AOIP, um, you know, you know, two th it was built in 2010. So, um, you know, very, very earlier versions and, and still element and, uh, and stuff like that. So over the years, I've had the ability to upgrade everything, uh, you know, right from the switches to, uh, you know, the engines and it's, it's been a real fun process. I take it that, uh, well, you're still doing some operations internally, but uh, some some stations that have had to uh, vacate the premises, glad they had audio over IP as their as their underlying technology because they were able to to operate it remotely. Absolutely, uh, you know, gad uh, I wouldn't I don't want to say gadgets, but applications like you know Pathfinder. Uh, Pro, Pathfinder, Core Pro, um, we're able to control those pots uh, remotely. Um, mm. You know, get on a VPN, um, um, get on, get on a computer, uh, turn on pots up and down. Um, it's been it's been a game changer. So um, really thankful for that. It's made it a lot easier. Hey, we have a uh, hello here. Uh, this is from Facebook from Robert, and I hope it's pronounced Shied. Robert Shied from Lancaster, PA. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for watching and commenting. Good to hear from you. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, we're into the uh, the section of the show where we talk about a tip of the week, and I'm I'm going to go first if you don't mind, and and give Mike a moment to figure out his tip of the week. Uh, my my <laughs> my tip relates to something that we did a year ago, about a year ago, on the show. We gave away some of these these HD radios, uh, HD car radio. It was designed to uh, be an add on to your existing car radio to add HD, AM HD, FM HD, and uh, uh, I wanted to use these myself as uh, fixed radios. Um, these you see are not for resale. We got some leftover ones uh, that came, I believe, from CBS Radio. 
uh, in, in their uh, promoting. So we gave away a few of these and I kept a couple for myself, but I never hooked them up until recently. And when I hooked them up, oh, I discovered a problem, terrible problem, awful problem. The audio coming out of the jacks. Here, here's the radio right here. It's got a it's got a little head unit right here that you that you can velcro or mount somewhere. So that's the head unit for tuning and uh, things like that. And then here's the part that you can hide. It's got uh, a connection for your car antenna, Motorola connector, to go in, and another one to come back out if you want to go back out to your existing receiver. You can. You can uh, take the audio that this receives and you can modulate it on an FM frequency and pick it up on your existing tuner if you want to. And that works fine. But it also has RCA outputs. And I wanted to use these RCA outputs to feed into my Axia network here. Well, ended up with a problem. Um, the problem was the audio output from these RCA jacks was terrible. It was clipped, distorted. It was just awful. And I thought, well, what, what, what can the problem be? So I unboxed the other one and tried it. Same problem. So did a little sleuthing on the internet. And sure enough, I found that other people complained about this too. And somebody had a fix. Now I've taken the screws out of the sides of this so I can easily pop the top off and show you the inside. And here it is upside down. Hold this next to the camera. And you can see the RCA connectors, the red and white connectors here and here. Well, apparently when they built these things, they didn't, properly or according to the circuitry they didn't ground the uh the ground side of these rca connectors so all you have to do there's it just so happens you can almost see them there there's a little metal tab at the top of each of these rca connectors there may be one on the bottom too toward the circuit board but they didn't tie it to ground the way they were supposed to so if you'll just take a piece of wire and solder it to uh one or i did both both of these RCA connectors to the little tab there. And then I ran it over to this screw right here. I used insulated wire, of course, and stripped it for these two and then stripped it over here for this screw. Tie those together. The audio is perfect. Problem solved. So if you got one of these from, uh, from our show last year as a prize, I'm sorry it didn't work out of the box. I apologize. I didn't know. And I'm sorry it took me a year to find out. But I found out. That's the fix, and now they sound great. And as showing you the rest of um, uh, of my tip, if you'll give me just a second here, I want to show you a little video. I want to show you how I'm using these receivers, and I'm going to see if I can get some more of these and put them at my radio station because they keep their tuning through a power outage. So if you tune them to something and power dies, when the power comes back on, the radio comes back on and it tunes back to where it was, even if it's an HD signal. So here's a little video. Here's my setup for constant audio on my Axia network here at uh, the Nashville office of the TELUS Alliance. Uh, first of all, up here we have a Tivoli FM tuner and it comes into this node right here on input number one. I can listen to it easily on the intercom system from Infinity. Pump uh, said, you know, about, he was talking about fraud and that's why we changed back the paper because when I first right. voted, it was. And then I have uh, this directed tuner on WSIX's FM HD3. It's my, I call it directed A. And then I have this one tuned to WRVW's HD2, which is WLAC AM. Terms at sportsbook.vanduel.com. For problem gambling support, call 1-800-889-9789. Hi, this is Robin Helsel. So again, all of these tuners I have coming into this node, three different tuners, uh, then they're available on the Axia network, and I can pick them up, for example, on uh, just for monitoring on the Telos Infinity IP intercom system, but I can also uh, pick them up elsewhere in the office on other computers and pieces of equipment. There you go. Thanks. So that's my tip of the week. Uh, you can buy these uh, on eBay. They're, they seem to go for about 90 bucks, maybe 75 bucks. So anyway, that's my tip of the week. I, I like I like these, but you got to solve the audio problem first. There you go. Mike? I, I do too. Uh, let me know when you turn your, your display blue. Oh. Yes. Oh my gosh. There yeah, the go. display is this orange color. And you're, how'd you get blue? There's, there's my nod to uh, the engineers at KSL in Salt Lake. I can get your station in Edmonton most nights in HD. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I bought a new truck uh, that didn't have HD in it. Uh, so I was looking for a solution and I found that solution. Thanks to your show. Um, same problem. Uh, 
grounded those out and no problem. Um, and uh, yeah, sounding great, working great. And, uh, and, and, and the thing was, it came orange, but the rest of the interior is blue. Well, I had to have blue. You got to have blue. So I went on eBay and found like, a, you know, <laughs> small surface mount LEDs and just heated them up and heated them off, put the new ones on. And there you go. And now it looks the same. So, so, wait a minute, so you, you took the little head thing, a uh, head unit here. Yeah. Apart. Yeah, I do. Yeah. How, yeah, I how do. did you get? Oh, it's oh, it's got screws. That's not so bad. I, did, did you have to break anything to get it apart, or just the screws no, did it? There's uh, there's I think three screws. There's one yeah. you have to be careful right underneath the wire there. Yeah. Um, take that one out and then just you know gently crack the rest. Well, I shouldn't say crack, but <laughs> pop the rest of it open. Yeah. Um, and then it's just a little bit more effort to get the uh the screen played out, and uh, away you go. Now, and you are, are they surface mount LEDs? In fact. They are surface mount LEDs. So, so you have, how did you get in there and just and warm them up and pop them off? Yeah, I, I shake really bad. <laughs> I, <laughs> but, but, but you think the funny thing about that too is, is, and, and you know, when I went to school, I had a guy in, uh, I had a friend in, in, in our class, b brilliant, book smart. But when it came to the soldering class, he says, no, I'll take an F. I just, I can't solder anything. And, uh, and, and I'm kind of the same way. Like I shake really bad, but once you grab that soldering iron, it's no problem or grab that heat gun. No problem. As long as you know which end to have the soldering iron to pick up. That's fine. Yeah, hey, exactly. Right. You know, don't want to <laughs> smell like Turkey. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry. Was, was that your tip, or, or, or did you have something no, else too? Um, yeah, man, I do have. Yeah, there's. There you go. If you if you get that, yeah, you can change those out to blue. No, um, my tip is in every uh, processing manual at the start of every processing manual is don't think you're going to get it in one day. Uh, I know a lot of folks, PDs, engineers who who, who think that uh, you know I'm going to put this on, I'm going to make it sound amazing right away. But uh, no, you you gotta. You got to play. And and if you're trying to communicate that to a program director, just make sure you get across that, you know, we're going to get this on the air and it's going to take, you know, four or five days, but, you know, or five, six days. Don't spend too much time, you know, come at it 15 minutes, take those headphones off, let your ears relax. Um, because I think that was one of the biggest mistakes I did when I started um, kind of self-teaching myself how to set up audio processors properly. It was like, okay, that sounds really great. And come back the next day. I'm like, oh, I don't know what yeah. the heck I was thinking. So, um, you know, make sure that you take the time, you know, if you can take the time to do it, um, don't try and don't try to, don't try to make it perfect in one night. It doesn't happen. So I think that's my, that's my tip. That, that is excellent advice. I have, I've made that mistake myself. I've gone, I've even been hired to go somewhere and set up processing for somebody. And, uh, boy, if you adjust processing at two o'clock in the morning, your head's probably not screwed on straight. And you get up from the hotel room the next morning, get in the rental car and you listen to it and you go, Oh, what was I yeah. thinking? Uh, that's pretty aggressive. Like, uh, it's, let's uh, over. Yeah, we we need to go back and fix that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good, good, good. good. Hey, I've got a couple more quick uh, comments to pop on here. Uh, Jesse Grafham says, "Nice, although the Looking Glass in Salt Lake City is more fun." I don't know what the Looking Glass is. Looking Glass is that Looking Glass like Nautel's Looking Glass? The uh, uh, that oh, that maybe product. That's it. Maybe maybe that's it. Maybe um, that's it. I don't know. Oh, Alex Hartman. Yeah, Alex Hartman. Yes, yes, yeah, you got it. Yeah. I, I I love I enjoy uh, talking to Alex Hartman um, on the couple of times I've talked to him because yeah. he was the same person who helped me get a uh, breakaway on one of those uh, for are you what was it like the, the TV 5.1 uh, chassis. Oh, yeah. So yeah. in my living room, I've got an audio processor in there. and I love playing with that. Thing. And in, J Jesse's listening live and he comments again. Yes, indeed. What a machine. Yeah, OK, good. Thanks for the thing. I, I had, you know, um, uh, I don't know that the looking glass is still being sold now that Alex um, uh, uh, works with uh, Nautel. And I think he uh, uh, sold the uh, technology to Nautel. I don't know. Some, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. I hope it doesn't go away. One more quick uh, note from Robert Scheid. He said, yes, you got my last name correct. You do a great job every week. What a great note to end the show on. <laughs> So, <laughs> if, can I just drop one more thing in here Absolutely. too? Kirk? Please. I, I I just uh, I have to say, hey, thanks so much for taking the time out. You, Greg Shea, uh, Jeff Walton, uh, Miguel Perez, um, uh, uh, some, and those are just some of the names. Scott Farr, um, uh, who attended uh, and presented for uh, the Western Association of Broadcast Engineers in Canada. Uh, unfortunately, the program that I took uh, in, in, at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, the Broadcast Engineering Program, uh, it has unfortunately gone away. Um, and 
we don't really have that resource uh, anymore to teach young broadcast engineers who who want to get into this industry. And there's a huge need to get um, more people into this industry. It ain't dead. It's it's huge. It's still alive. Um, and and uh, we need to pass on all of that all of that knowledge. So uh, the Western Association of Broadcast Engineers, you know, our mission statement is to make sure that. Uh, people are educated and, and, and people are getting those resources. So um, if you know someone who wants to get into that, uh, who's in Canada and, and, uh, and, and may not have that broadcast engineering resource anymore to go to school, uh, reach out to Wabi. Um, this is the first year we've ever had it um, online. We didn't know how it was, how well it was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, but people like yourself really made it an amazing show um, um, at broadcast engineers from all over Canada were able to attend and watch it. We had an amazing turnout and it's folks like uh, you, Kirk, who uh, really make the difference. Um, and we're going to keep this going year after year. So uh, um, Wabi is a huge, important part uh, of, 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 of broadcast engineer education. I'm glad you mentioned that in, in Canada, Wabi is a great clearinghouse connecting uh, uh uh, maybe you could, mentors and mentees uh, in the U.S. Uh, the Society of Broadcast Engineers at SBE.org uh, does have a mentoring program, and and so that that works well in the U.S. Uh, I know SBE is is a bit worldwide. I don't know how active the mentoring program is in other places, but thanks for uh, letting us know that Wabi is doing that uh, in Canada. That's awesome. And, and and everybody loved your presentation. Everybody loves Kirk. We got to get oh. Kirk on more. So and you know what was amazing about that? Well, we were kind of worried about how many people would. Uh, actually be able to present this year yeah. and uh even even during the show i had some people reach out to me going well we didn't know you were on the uh, the committee for this so uh, can we please be on next year so uh, we had an amazing outreach uh, of presenters and and it's only going to grow bigger so we're going to keep this thing growing bigger and we want everybody's participation and and we thank everybody for that too so thank you well as, as a presenter i feel like the the platform and everything was very professional and it, it worked well and i was uh, uh, very glad to be be part of that so thanks thanks for much all right we got to go <laughs> my friend ray ray fisher tony says looking glass recorded brandy Remember that, Brandy? Oh, you're you're yes. a fine, you're a fine girl. You don't remember that? You weren't even born yet. No, it's what I think. Your it was parents like hadn't even hooked up by then. What was that? A Chevy <laughs> or a Dodge commercial? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh gosh yeah. all right we we, we got to go uh hey i want to say uh happy thanksgiving day to chris tobin also to suncast and to andrew zarian they're usually with us but uh, hey i'm glad that uh i had lunch early and uh mike uh mike wasn't celebrating uh, thanksgiving day today just I'm, tim I'm, just tim horton day just, just timmy's <laughs> all right hey uh we got next week on this week in radio tech i forget who we've got on uh but whatever it is going to be you know next week if uh, here, here's here's the if then else, if I test negative for COVID tomorrow morning, and I won't know until Sunday night. But if I test negative for COVID tomorrow morning, and my business partner Larry Fuss also tests negative for COVID tomorrow morning, then the both of us will be on a flight to uh, to Lahui, Kauai, Hawaii, and uh, to the radio station KHKU FM because we got some work to do. And and uh, so if, if it's all negative, we go. And I'll be doing this week in radio tech from Hawaii next week. If uh, if either one of us is positive, then the trip's off, and um, we'll come to you from here in the in the uh, Telus Alliance studios. Mike, thanks so much for being with us. I really appreciate you. Take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it sounds glamorous and wonderful. And Kauai is a the most beautiful island. It's the the Garden Island. It's beautiful, but we just got work to do. We got we got you know hard labor to do. It's it's uh, and when when you work with Larry Fuss, there's never a, a a moment where you get to you know just relax. Doesn't exist. Fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we gotta go. Thanks for joining us, Mike, and thanks again to uh, Suncast, who's going to be uh, producing this show and putting it on uh, on YouTube for us. And we'll see you next week on this week in radio tech. Bye bye.